It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 272 at block height 688,420 <laughs> on Monday, June 21st. So, what is up, guys? What's with the cackle? <laughs> Come on. 688,420. Eh? Eh? Got a burn. Eh? No. What? Doing good. Hold it on, is like me, a what? Let, let me see if I can I can do this. Okay. Oh, uh, that block height. Yeah, it's a uh, stony block digest. Uh, no, it's a uh, powerful <laughs> episode. Just at the stony block height. How you doing, guys? I'm doing well over here. I'm contemplating that. <laughs> not too shabby. She now has to remember we're not his kitty. Man, I'm just enjoying myself on account of that block height. It's 420 somewhere. Right now on the blockchain. Well, there oh, you go. Oh, I get it now. <laughs> Cannabis is medicine, people. All right, though. All right. So, it seems like we got a good show today, just like I was saying before they went to air. We got a El Salvador heavy hitting news episode, but like we were saying, it's probably going to be the story for a while. Mm-hmm. So, th- this first one um, is literally just five seconds and springboards right into a hysterical thought experiment that FUD will walk us through. But uh, on the 16th, uh, El Salvador asked the World Bank directly for help um, in terms of implementing their uh, Bitcoin regime after the bill. And the World Bank told them no because of environmental and transparency shortcomings. But then something funny got dug up. Yeah. So people have been looking at uh, Section 12, Article 5 of the World Bank's incorporation documents that were made way back in 1944, uh, back when countries used a little currency called gold. And uh, they've been questioning what it means now uh, in modern terms uh, with A, nobody holding a gold-backed currency anymore, and B, now they're being potential for Bitcoin or a Bitcoin backed currency. So this uh, Section 12, Article 5 reads, the bank shall accept from any member in place of any part of the member's currency paid in the bank under Article 2, Section 7i, or to meet amortization payments on loans made with such currency and not needed by the bank in its operations, notes or similar obligations issued by the government of the member or the depository designated by such member. Uh, so what's what's interesting about that, and I guess that goes on to say, which shall be non-negotiable, non-interest bearing and payable at their par value on demand by credit to the account of the bank in the designated depository. Um, so it sounds like you can use secondary depositories, uh, which at probably one point meant a place like the Federal Reserve with literal gold bars. Um, it also says notes and similar obligations can be used to pay up at the World Bank. I think this is an interesting one. Uh, and probably in a future world, it also means you could deliver physical Bitcoin. I think this leaves a lot of interesting space in, in where we are now. And the reason I say that is because if Bitcoin is an official uh, currency of the uh, El Salvadoran government, 
Uh, maybe it would need to become an official reserve asset, not clear on this, but there could be notes or similar obligations that are issued against a Bitcoin backing, which may or may not be at par value. Uh, I don't know exactly how that plays in. It would be great for somebody with some real experience on this to weigh in. Everybody's been passing around this particular clause this week. Uh, but just to throw out there, at one point, U.S. currency was something like 40% gold backed. And it, it functioned as a currency uh, that could pay for things the World Bank. And what I can't tell you would need to do some more research. I'm, I'm begging somebody else out there to go and do it so uh, we don't have to get into it. I, is What does that mean in this case? Uh, were those notes taken at the gold backing value? Were they taken at face value as supposedly one point they had uh, with gold dollar notes, um, which I believe was only guaranteed up until 34 uh, and then that backing came down. The way this reads, it almost sounds like once Venezuela, I'm sorry, not Venezuela, El Salvador <laughs> puts, I, I'm thinking ahead folks, I'm sorry. Uh, once El Salvador puts Bitcoin in that legal tender bucket, they could even issue a special class of notes or similar obligations, whatever similar obligations mean. Uh, I would posit that could mean the equivalent of the old $10,000 gold bill that was available in the United States, but they were not in common use. I don't know how far out of your way you had to go to get one, but theoretically you could go get one and it was U.S. Treasury issued currency maybe it was Fed issued currency at that time. And uh, you could go spend it like 10,000 bucks. So I, I think this just puts a question mark on if they wanted to issue a currency that was quote unquote Bitcoin backed, what does that mean? Because this makes it sound like the banks got to take it, whatever it means. Uh, hmm. And I think that's where the fun kicks off. Oh yeah, dude. Oh fuck yeah. Like, could you imagine if they just issued their own token on liquid backed by shit they keep in their own multi-sig vault? And then we can play games now. Oh, Bitcoin's crashing? Um, here, why don't we hedge ourselves in the market and uh, play games with the World Bank here? I think it's incredibly empowering for a couple of those reasons, because first, they get to define uh, what that obligation is. And second, just by notes and obligations nature, that means you don't have to surrender Bitcoin to anybody to play these games. That Bitcoin sits on your central bank's balance sheet or in your treasury, and the note goes wherever it needs to go. Uh, in this era of not actually clearing the physical for currency regimes, uh, this seems very empowering to El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's certainly an interesting little tidbit towards this whole story. I mean, like them saying they're not going to help El Salvador. And in the end, I mean, it does sort of seem like El Salvador has a hand to play as far as whether they want to issue a note like you're saying or uh, I mean, either way, doesn't it? I heard something about like this is where like if uh, if like a uh, Bitcoin is legal tender in El Salvador, then the World Bank would have to start actually holding Bitcoin on its balance sheet. And if enough other countries started to participate in a similar system, then, you know, it will those, you know, it's in suit, like they'll have to build even a bigger balance sheet of Bitcoin. Or was that some FUD? Well, well I think this clause refers to paying off obligations to the World Bank um the imf would be the fund the international monetary fund might be the place where that question comes more into play and i think you know they hold a a balance sheet that composes the elements of the sdr uh the special drawing rights which is essentially their internal currency which i believe is us dollars yen british pounds and i think chinese yuan are in there too there there may be couple more in that pool. Um, 
I also wonder how El Salvador officially using the dollar for currency and Bitcoin ultimately impacts this. Well, it's just like the way I, I've been looking about it in my head since you brought this up initially, FUD, was like these things like the World Bank generally have you as a country by the balls with your obligations to them, debts to them. And if you can just turn around and keep the Bitcoin sitting there on the main chain yourself and spin up some side chain notes or a physical thing or what, whatever the hell you want to do and dump that on the World Bank without relinquishing the physical Bitcoin, you can have them by the balls. Yo, welcome back to the gold standard. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I think some of the plan is for, like, in El Salvador, for some of the main banks to have Bitcoin on their balance sheet, I mean, all the time. So, I mean, issuing a note, I mean, they could deal with all sorts of uh, volatility. And, I mean, it's, yeah, it's just definitely, like, a strong play for them as far as what they want to do in the future. But let me just ask you, like, do you think that this is, like, ever getting to the point where they're going to issue, like, a Bitcoin like a uh, cash, like physical cash, like something like that? Or is it just like a, a, a side chain or, or a token or something? I think just something to mess with people. But I just realized, but I don't think we mentioned the possibility that you could just have like dollar denominated obligations backed by Bitcoin or things like that. So you can play even more fun games. Yeah, uh, you could issue some kind of bond, like a zero coupon bond, denominated in dollars, ostensibly back it by Bitcoin as opposed to dollars. I, I'm just not quite sure how far you can push all this. Yeah, well, in this world, I'm going to say you could just keep pushing and then we'll see where you know we land because uh, I don't think there's any going backwards. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, next up, though, Janine, you wanted to talk about uh, Jerry Brito's write-up of really the one big downside of this whole thing. Yeah, so uh, as someone who generally doesn't believe that decisions by states have good and just outcomes that couldn't be better achieved through other means, um, I have not personally paid as much attention to what's happened in El Salvador as a lot of other people have lately with their new legal tender law for Bitcoin outside of what we've discussed on Block Digest and watching the recap. Uh, I watched the recap between Peter McCormick and Jack Mallers and... Uh, I mean, the, all the grassroots stuff down there sounds really great, um, but a few days ago, Jerry Brito, who's the executive director of Coin Center, tweeted his opinion about this new development uh, regarding the legal tender stuff, and I think in a lot of ways it reflects some of my misgivings and why I'm a bit hesitant to uh, celebrate. Um, and so in his first th uh, thread, he said, while I haven't been shy with my views on the El Salvador Bitcoin law, I feel I really haven't said my piece. So I'm going to get it off my chest now. Perhaps one has a duty to speak out or else be complicit in sorry outcomes. El Salvador's Bitcoin law is a disgrace. As written in statute, it forces citizens to accept Bitcoins whether or not whether they want to or not. This is intuitively wrong to any liberal. I'm surprised that so many smart and principled people have nevertheless applauded and defended this law. They are confusing the ends of liberty with the means of Bitcoin, and I hope they're doing so merely in error. It's especially disappointing that in response to criticism, defenders of this law have resorted to whataboutisms and moral equivalents. Uh, and I'm astonished by how much trust and deference so many are willing to give to a politician. This will not end well. I hope its defenders will take a second look at what this law does, reflect on our shared principles, and reevaluate accordingly. And then yesterday, he tweeted a bit more um, after, you know, additional discussions and getting responses from people to these opinions. He said, I haven't really spoken up because I figured what's the point of saying what I think. It's only going to get me hate, which is indeed what happened. But watching the conversation develop, uh, my conscience was, but or, but watching the conversation develop, my conscience was increasingly unsettled. I sincerely, sincerely hope that this all turns out well. But it's my considered view that it likely won't, and even if it does, it will be despite an injustice, not because of it. Uh, if I kept my view to myself, I felt I would be complicit in a narrative that was being shaped and its consequences. I was reflecting on a book by, uh, and I will might butcher this name. Uh, Rishikesh Joshi, 
or Yoshi, um, I recently read that argues that one has a duty to speak one's mind, especially in the face of social pressure. That all said, I want to address two arguments I keep hearing. First, the fact that one doesn't have to hold BTC doesn't, from a moral perspective, mitigate the fact that under the law, uh, one is compelled to accept it even if one doesn't want to. That's not how I want to see Bitcoin reach its potential. If you disagree with me, I hope you can at least respect my view. Second, there's the argument that in practice, the law won't be strictly enforced. That's probably true, but that doesn't make a law just. By that logic, all the laws that uh, crime a day, which, uh, side note, is one of my favorite Twitter accounts, uh, it basically shows you all the ways that you can easily become a federal criminal, and they even wrote a book about it. Um, So all the laws that crime a day highlights are just fine. Also, as long as something is the law, it means that it can be enforced, even maliciously and arbitrarily, if the state decides to. Again, I sincerely hope that this all all turns out well, but I have no reason to have faith in Mr. Bukele. Indeed, a bit of the opposite. This is not the way I want Bitcoin to succeed. Yeah, and I mean, I don't disagree with anything he said, but, you know, the law passed. Um until that changes in terms of politicians actually listening to that argument, reconsidering that, I mean, this is what it is now. Yeah, I think the definition of legal tender is that you can use it to distinguish, uh, extinguish all that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, like I said, when we first covered it, that is the one thing I did not like about this law. Like the fact that it goes further than pre-existing debts and actually obligates the accepting of it with the assumption that the government can just always magically exchange that for dollars if you don't want to keep it. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I mean, again, my preference is for anything the state does to in general move in the direction of we are going to put less barriers in front of people doing things, um, not... uh not forcing people to engage in things that maybe they don't want to even if we really like those things and like bitcoin and think they're not malicious or harmful um but yeah uh i generally uh if if it was just a matter of you know the state now is saying it will accept it um which it will um that is one thing that is the state saying that um and the state can decide what it wants to do in terms of what money it accepts i guess but yeah, in terms of, I don't like the idea of forcing people to engage with Bitcoin if they don't want to. And yes, in practice, will that happen? Maybe not. But, you know, again, uh, as he says, there's a lot of weird laws that Crime Day tweets that probably don't get enforced at all. But the whole point of it is that technically people, at least in the US, who are subject to American laws are walking around and could be prosecuted under any of those things at any time without knowing it. Um, there's this, you know, kind of line about how you commit five felonies a day without knowing it, um, because the laws are just so ridiculous. And so I agree with that perspective that having laws that are criminalizing behavior that is not harmful to anyone is in fact harmful in itself, having that kind of perspective on justice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely understand that position, and it's just hard for me to say, like, uh, I, you know, I just uh, see, like, a standpoint of the reality of El Salvador, and they're in a really tough bind through a monetary policy that was pushed onto them already, and I understand, like, uh, you know, the state moving to force people to do things uh, is definitely the wrong way to go, but it is like, you know, it's like, this is the president and he's got this overwhelming majority and, you know, they voted this stuff in. And I imagine like, uh, like we're saying, you know, the citizens of that country will probably be better off for it, but this is like a clunky kind of chicken and egg process with, you know, Bitcoin and states and decentralized projects and centralized entities. And it's a real hard uh, way to say that, like, oh, well, here's how you write the letter of the law to get it correct. And I and that's where I'm just going to give them the, you know, the, the credence and like the slack to say, like, you know, they're trying to solve a bigger problem that's been pushed onto them from a long time ago. 
and that this is sort of their, as far as their way forward, this is what they found the words to put together to solve that problem. And, you know, if it's, uh, if it's something that in practice is not, you know, I mean, well, like we know, it's not really appropriate in practice to do that. And so, you know, maybe it won't get enforced and, We'll just see how it goes. I mean, like you said, I listened to that uh, to that what Bitcoin did between uh, Peter McCormick and Jack Mallers, and I'd suggest anybody that's thinking about this should listen to that episode because it really gives a pretty clear perspective of how this all went about. And you know, it's a it's a weird place to be, but this has to start somewhere. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. just to be clear, the the cool stuff that I see happening there is the grassroots stuff, like people deciding on their own volition to accept Bitcoin, realizing that it helps them, and trying to help others. Um, like that. Basically, the summary of what Jerry said here that I really agree with is the part where he says that you know, if this all goes well, it will be, be it will be despite an injustice, not because of it. Like I don't think the legal tender law is going to help. It, like it'll draw attention to the fact that oh my god a state made bitcoin legal tender um and that may draw the attention of other state actors to uh, mostly of small countries to do the same but in general the what's happening there that's powerful is going to be because of the people on the ground not because a politician decided to make bitcoin legal tender yeah at the end of the day in support of this what it hopefully becomes a movement you need a lot of ironically, trusted third parties. And who are those trusted third parties? At the very least, software vendors and probably institutions that use trusted software vendors. Uh, you know, if you want to, say, buy a house in the United States, most likely somebody's going to send a fed wire for a bunch of money somewhere else through a very trusted system that ultimately allows you to sign all the documents and finalize buying that house, right? The software equivalent of that has to come to these places and people have to come to trust it on the individual level all the way to the financial system level. And then you can really say it's been successful. So now they're in the phase of building that out. Hey guys, I, I've got a joke for you. Yep. The government is excellent and utilizes your tax dollars efficiently. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yes. Well, I mean, like, it is a younger generation over there. It seems like, uh, you know, whenever you look at the statistics from El Salvador, there's a lot of young people there. This is a young president, and this is kind of a youth movement. And, you know, it's a populist movement and there's individuals in there that are building out these solutions like the Bitcoin Beach story. You know, that's kind of like where this all started from. And, uh, you know, that sort of software layer needs to keep getting built out. And luckily, you know, um, there's, you know, really just this great, really miracle of like, you know, Jack Mallers and Strike and their ability to come in and try and help like, uh, you know, bridge the gap that, you know, Bitcoin Beach was trying to solve and, you know, and hopefully they could just keep moving out from that local layer and local layers. But uh, let me just like bring this into the next story because I mean, like, you know, that kind of has to do with, uh, sorry, I lost my notes for a second, is, uh, you know, this, like, we knew this was going to happen, just not so soon. Some scammers have entered El Salvador and uh, Brock Pierce accompanied a delegation of his friends and hired people to give the appearance he's helped El Salvador come to Bitcoin. This is all, of course, derived from his BS official position with the Bitcoin Foundation. No one who's belonged to that foundation takes that seriously. And it was always a bad idea because it left the door open for charlatan spooks like Brock Pierce. Everyone talks on Twitter right now, who's a spook? This guy is pretty suspect. I mean, he's been involved, he's been involved with sex trafficking since the 90s. He has ties with friends who are powerful political figures and even attended events with Jeffrey Epstein. And now, to be honest, I don't think he's really in there trying to shitcoin as much as he's trying to politic. After his arrival with others, they had a meeting in a hotel where they slept, then checked out the next day. Of course, they got a photo op in this large room with flags to make it seem like they're meeting with the El Salvadorian government. However, no one from government or Bitcoin Beach attended their dinner. 
they got the photos they needed for a headline. And uh, thanks to Mononaut, <clears throat> Mononautical on Twitter, we can see the headline really belongs to a rag publication, Noticia. Noticia is a small paper located in Long Island owned by Schneps Media. And Schneps Media has been buying large amounts of local publications around the U.S. and other areas to write glowing articles about politicians. Former editor-in-chief Vince Domitiel said, quote, It very quickly became clear that they are less of a news company than a promotion company, and they wanted to make sure that anything we wrote about any politician was glowing, close quote. And as we know, Brock Pierce recently made a run for president in 2020, and his interview with a Fox Business News associate shows him talking only in Bitcoin. However, he doesn't once mention Jack Maller's strike or Bitcoin Beach in his interview. Nothing about lightning, even. And uh, it's all about his position in, quote, an official Bitcoin delegation to help El Salvador, close quote, which in a few years... When the success of this new legislation is showing its fruit, I'm sure this slimy politician will grab his headlines to say he helped, and it's bullshit. There was that recent episode of What Bitcoin Did that we were just talking about, and uh, that was between Peter McCormick and Jack Mallers. You know, it says the whole story on El Salvador, where they discuss all things related to El Salvador, and if you haven't listened to that episode yet, go listen to it. It's got all the details on Jack working with Bitcoin Beach to working with the president and local banks to create an entirely unbuilt infrastructure. And it's incredible work, and it's important everyone try to get a clear picture as possible on what's going on. And uh, you can hear the, those two discuss this problem with scammers, this one I'm discussing to, to you, and uh, how they saw it on the ground and what they heard through their contacts. So, uh, but like we're saying, you know, this is a country of individuals and, you know, this delegation of scammers came into El Salvador and luckily, you know, they all didn't really participate in this, uh, this dinner. I mean, I think some of this, uh, some of these people that were a part of this delegation did go to the Bitcoin beach, but, uh, nobody from the Bitcoin beach or the El Salvadorian government attended their event. But what do you guys think of that? Um... All I can say is I can't imagine any reasonable person wanting to defend a scumbag piece of shit like this. But yeah, you hit the nail on the head. This is sociopathic political maneuvering. All the usual from Brock Pierce. Yeah, I could definitely see his, you know, he's going to have his like ads in 2023 or whatever. It's coming or whenever he's, he's a politician now. And those guys are slimy. And I'm, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm going to say that even goes with the El Salvadorian president, but, uh, you know, well, we'll just give him some credence with Bitcoin, I guess. Is he still part of the Bitcoin Foundation or whatever that disgrace of an organization is? <sighs> um, I think so. But from what I saw, like they haven't even had a meeting or like updated any corporate records or anything since like 2019, I think. Yeah, I, I believe that we actually covered that, and the reason we covered it is because they reported that they held more Ether than Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. This is where, like, the remaining people out there that do give a shit about Bitcoin that are in this space should come together and, like, dismantle that in some sort of fashion, or some sort of official capacity to where this guy can stop saying, like, he's some official anything. Governments. Governments. All right, well, I guess that covers the El Salvador news of the day. So it looks like it was uh, a busy day for Wasabi at some point, huh? Yeah, this is uh, just a short story to cover the recent DDoS attack against Wasabi. Um, they published a report about it recently, which uh, says a lot of things. Um, Wasabi Wallet. The Wasabi Wallet team received an alert email from the hosting server on June 6, 2021, or approximately... 16 UTC, informing us that we were experiencing a massive DDoS attack and that for security reasons, traffic will be analyzed to assess the extent of the attack. Then they provide like a timeline in the post of things that they did, and they actually put some mitigations in place and thought that those mitigations stopped the attack. But then I guess they later found out that that their mitigations weren't uh, causal to the attack stopping. It might have just been shut off. But 
They report that the intensity they label as intensity of the attack was several million packets per second. Uh, bandwidth involved several gigabytes per second, and total downtime for their back end was four hours and 42 minutes. Um, of course, given that Wasabi is a non-custodial wallet, uh, everybody's funds were safe. Um, it was the back-end services, the coordinator, that experienced downtime and were not reachable by users. Um, they don't make any claims about who they think is responsible, um, either because they do not want to disclose that yet or are still investigating it, um, or it's a mystery, so don't know, but just wanted to mention that that happened because um, I think this is the largest... Uh, this is the longest downtime they've had, as far as I'm aware. I mean, it could be anybody. Like, actually, in the last year, I think um, Samurai's coordinator has been DDoS like two or three times, too. Yeah, they have. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, like, the work that those guys are doing, I mean, I'm surprised it's not happening more often, to be honest. Mm hmm. So, are we ready for an autism? Oh, an autism moment. Okay, so what's been going on with uh, Taproot? My spectrum is ready. Well, um, this is actually kind of funny because I'm going to have to deconstruct something I'm unsure about, about future Lightning Network plans now. Um, but Chris Belcher has proposed a new standard for wallets to use. Um, to kind of modify the fee sniping protection that some wallets use now um, to also provide potential fungibility improvements for all kinds of second layer stuff like lightning or coin swaps. Um, and so the way that this works now for wallets like Bitcoin Core or Electrum, um, they set the end lock time in a transaction to the next block, like after the current one, so that it's not possible if a miner reorgs something to put your transaction in the new version of the current block. And kind of the, the reason for this is just long term to always create an incentive for miners to continue progressing the chain instead of fighting over like large fees or something in the long term when all their income is based on fees. So Chris's proposal here is essentially to 50-50 split some of the time use and lock time for that like it is done now, um, but also the other half of the time to use the end sequence number in the inputs, which um, relates to the relative time lock. So instead of an absolute block height, It'll only be valid if the UTXO that it's spending has existed for this much time or this many blocks. And the idea would be to make um, kind of the timeout revealing for lightning stuff after that implements um, taproot and kind of evolves for that, where you can use adapter signatures instead of a hash preimage, um, kind of create ambiguity about whether or not something is just a random wallet doing this or an actual lightning transaction um, closing out. And kind of the thing I'm unsure of here um, is from my understanding, the dominant thinking post taproot for lightning was to actually bury an explicit um, CSV script under taproot for the timeout path and then just use an adapter signature on the main key for the success path. And that wouldn't work with Chris's idea because any, um, if, if I'm kind of reasoning about this right, any timeout path would reveal that taproot path that has the CSV opcode in it, which random wallets doing things wouldn't. And so I'm kind of thinking this would require um, using a pre-signed transaction with the end sequence amounts um, kind of set for that timeout from a multi-sig output and then just use a separate pre-signed transaction for the um, successful payment completion with the adapter signature. So actually make both ways that an HTLC output could or a PTLC output now um, could resolve a pre-signed transaction 
instead of an explicit time lock code in the output. But if, if things were structured like that and Chris's idea was implemented, then whenever wallets randomly set the unsequenced number, they would kind of just look um, and see if there was a reasonable time period that isn't too long, because if it's too long, it'll obviously not be a lightning settlement. Um, and you know, if the input is fresh enough, you can just tweak that. And then you would create complete ambiguity between what is just a wallet doing something normally on chain or a lightning thing closing out and HTLCs being refunded or settled. And so, um, yeah, I think he kind of hits the nail on the head in his write up. Uh, we need to be very loud about this and start talking about this with wallet developers as everybody starts working on Taproot implementation because this is the perfect time to try to get a behavior like this widely adopted. And it would have a massive, um, like subtle fungibility improvement for both things happening purely on chain and a whole bunch of second layer things. Well, this sounds awesome. I mean, the more that you can make that uh, settlement between Lightning and Bitcoin, this just look more, uh, you know, obfuscated as far as like what whether that's a uh, regular transaction or a transaction of a Lightning settlement. That's definitely going to help. Mm -hmm. And guess what? You guys win another what? autism. Oh, yay! Now, what's yay. this one about? So, um, ZMNSCPXJ. Um, a while back posted um, an idea Z, to keep lightning keys offline some of the time. And this has kind of become a, a topic of discussion again with, with a lot more attention on it. So I figured we could go through it. Um, so right obviously a big downside of lightning is you have to be online to receive money. You have to sign something. Well, um, this proposal doesn't completely remove the need to come online and sign things, but it does allow a peer to forward you some number of HTLCs without you being online and kind of keeping things um, safe. And so pretty much how this would work is you're offline, Rick. I'm trying to forward you a payment from somebody. Normally what we would do is both update our commitment transactions. You would be online. Um, add the HTLC output, and then we would settle that when you give me the pre-image, um, remove the HTLC output, and then you received your money. You have to be online with your key to sign for that. So Z-Man's proposal here is what I could do is make a new commitment transaction while you're offline and use the same revocation key, which I do not have yet, um, as the current state. And then I can give you a commitment transaction that only I have signed with the um, new HTLC output on it. And so the idea is like you come back online and you we can update everything. But the way to keep this safe, because we haven't revoked the last state yet like nobody has the revocation key for that i could still go haha -ha, and close out the um most recent before this new one channel state where that htlc doesn't exist so what i'll do is i'll take my output from that um prior state without the htlc and i will make a new transaction spending it that also creates the new HTLC. And so the idea is like within the time span of the, the timeout where things can just get refunded, um, as long as you come online that frequently to check for things, then that's committed to because it doesn't matter whether you come online and um, you know sign your half of the new commitment transaction and then settle that with the HTLC on it. Or if I cheat and I go push the old one to chain because nobody ch or swapped revocation keys for it. Because if I push the old one, you still, when you come online, get this new transaction spending from that output that adds the HTLC. 
So as long as you at least come online um, frequently enough within those time lock windows, you can be forwarded a payment and be able to keep your private key offline except to kind of come online and check again and then update everything or react to something if I was a dickhead and I pushed the old channel state to change. Well, this just all sounds like solid lightning development. Fantastic. And thus concludes the autisms. <laughs> well, seriously, that does sound very interesting, and I'm glad that, uh, you know, that kind of development is going on. I've been seeing more and more of uh, what's been going on with the lightning network, and it just blows my mind. As, like, you know, we started reporting on just, like, you know, the first while it's going live, so it's incredible. The autisms never conclude, Shinobi. Yeah, they do. Somewhere that over the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll get out of the autism and into... Somebody accused me last week of uh, being a conspiracy theorist. Well, I guess, you know, because I said that, you know, it's possible that we ransomware ourselves or something. So, uh, you know, <laughs> oh, let's did. get into that corner. So there's another ransomware attack in the U.S., and this one was on a nuclear weapons facility. Well... The U.S. contractor Sol Orleans, Sol Orleans suffered a cyber attack supposedly at the hands of the Revil ransomware gang. The headline says this was Russia. a nuclear... Oh, yeah. You know it immediately. <laughs> so, it's always Russia. Yeah. Well, let's, let's get there. No, I'm no, not no. the conspiracy theorist here. I was just going to say when it's not Russia, it's Russia. Oh, yeah. Russia. <laughs> So the headline says this was a nuclear weapons facility that was hit. However, the information can't directly point to those facilities since the, that information is classified. Bleeping Computer points to recent job postings requesting program managers, consultants, and a nuclear weapons system subject matter expert. However, Sol Orleans is a defense contractor working with the U.S. military and describes themselves as, quote, we help, Department of De we help Department of Defense and Department of Energy organizations, aerospace contractors, and technology firms carry out complex programs. We focus on ensuring that there are well-developed technologies available to maintain a strong national defense, close quote. If you check out their site, it looks like they are doing a lot of work across the spectrum for highly classified methods of warfare, which could make this story a little more concerning than just a nuclear weapons facility which in itself shouldn't be taken lightly and really shows the scale of cyber warfare we're engaged in. The responsible party has been apparently identified as Ransomware Evil, better known as Revil, which uses similar code as the Darkside Ransomware Group. I don't know if uh, that's what they've identified this group to... Hold up. Sorry, I just had to move up. I don't know if that's why they've identified this group to be linked to Russia once again, but... That's what this article claims. Bleeping Computer says, quote, Like many other ransomware operators, Revil is believed to be operating out of Russia or another CIS country. Close quote. <laughs> <laughs> you called it. So Revil has been linked to major cyber attacks in the very recent past, like the JBS meat supplier in May of this year. April of this year, they attacked Quantra computers who are tied to the development of Apple products. And in early March, they attacked Acer, which is a Taiwanese multinational hardware and electronics corporation. Soarin said in a statement regarding the hack, quote, The investigation is ongoing, but we recently determined that an unauthorized individual acquired certain documents from our systems. Those documents are currently under review, and we are working with a third-party technolo techno technological forensic firm to determine the scope of potential data that may have been involved. We have no current indication that this incident involves cl client classified or critical security related information. Once the investigation concludes, we are committed to notifying individuals and ent ent entities whose information is involved. Close quote. Last week, Revil listed companies whose data they were auctioning off to the highest bidder. One of the listed companies is Solarines, which Revil claims to have stolen business data and employee data, including salary information and social security numbers as proof they stole Ooh. data during the attack. Revil published images of a hiring overview document, payroll documents, and a wages report as a way to pressure Solarines into paying the ransomware gang threatened to share, quote, relevant document and data to military agencies of our choice, close quote. 
So here's another story about the proliferation of ransomware as a service, but do you guys think there's something bigger afoot? That's what do you think? That's fucking China, dude. That is the exact type of information that you would grab from a personnel database to try to suss out who's in a bad financial situation, who might have problems, like who who could you create financial incentives for to leak or try to get access to other information. Like that, that is the only reason you would go after a fucking database like that. Yeah, I mean, going after a Taiwanese, uh, you know, developer and, and all this I mean, it just looks like China. I just didn't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist. I'm glad somebody else said it. Are are they also the ones responsible for the uh, chastity devices that we talked about a few episodes ago, Shinobi? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember, actually. <laughs> oh, I do. I remember it very well. It's episode 250. No, I, I, just, think... I don't remember who, like, actually, like, what strain of uh, malware, what group that was. Um, I don't remember either. I don't think we know. All I remember is all a bunch of, a bunch of dick jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this definitely looks suspect. And I mean, like, if you look at just how many ransomwares have been going on, like, yeah, maybe it's not like I'm going to I'm going to pull. I'm not going to pull back a little bit from my last week's comments and say, like, maybe we're not attacking ourselves entirely or any of this. But there's definitely some sort of. Like, uh, I mean, you know, there's definitely some sort of internal method as far as attacking and then making sure Russia gets the blame. That's for sure. And I mean, it's just like that's it's almost like undeniable at this point where, like you were saying at the beginning, it's like just blame Russia. And, you know, Russia's got no reason to attack Acer. Russia's got no reason to attack this uh, this weapons contractor. I mean, other than like, you know. I mean, it just doesn't have the reasons that China has. Like, if you look at the incentives for it all, like, uh, it's, you know, it's China's the one that's kind of trying to invade Taiwan right now. It's China's the one that's already took Hong Kong. It's China the ones that's trying to push this narrative where nobody can talk about, you know, the origins of the virus or the potential of treatment. It's ridiculous. Also, just frankly, Russia is a hollow shell of itself. It cannot fucking support a fraction of the intelligence services and shit that China can. Right. That's also a big point. Like, I mean, just thinking about like the idea of Russian hackers versus Chinese hackers on like a scale on like a stage. It's like the Globetrotters versus like the what was that throwaway league? The Globetrotters always played, you know, like the Rockets or something like, you know, they were definitely going to lose. The Russians would lose against the Chinese hackers, man. Like, those guys know how to hack. There's ten times as many of them. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to try and not be such a conspiracy theorist, but for sure, if you're looking at information it's, warfare. It's called being a rational thinker. Yeah. We need more of those people out there. Next up, more China. Yep, China. Yep. So, um, Yeah. It might be time for skeptical shinobi to eat shit. Um, so a number of people um, from China who generally kind of are the initial sources of information um, have been talking about all kinds of farms being shut down um, for inspections um, in numerous parts of China. Um, with a, with a little bit of granularity, um, like we, we've already heard and talked about um, what happened in Xinjiang, but apparently um, Sichuan, which is the massive uh, bountiful hydropower region um, where everybody flocks to the rainy season, has been shutting things down too, as well as the province of Yunnan, although at least from local sources that Bitcoin Magazine has talked to, in Yunnan's case, um, it seems much more specifically targeted towards illegal mining operations that have extra legal um, agreements directly with power producers that are not supposed to happen there. Um, but then as well, um, Wu Blockchain, one of the accounts I follow that's usually pretty accurate um, after the fact with information coming out of China is saying that the Sichuan shutdowns have mostly been um, very large uh, mining farms and that a lot of the smaller, more spread out operations um, have not had anybody show up, not had anything shut down or anything so far. But 
yeah, uh, looking at the last few difficulty periods and the actual averages over time instead of just wild fluctuations, yeah, uh, hash rate has come down almost 100 exahashes in the last month or so. Um, and that's the actual long-term averages, not just, uh, you know, little volatility spike short term. So potentially, yeah, this is real. This is actually happening. And we'll see um, on the other side of this, if hash rate starts recovering um, where this went. But I just want to say, as much as the likely explanation is that People are just picking up and leaving, and we will see this come back online. Um, don't forget, this is fucking China. We are talking about the Communist Party. And I see no reason to just completely discount something. Like, they're just turning stuff off and back on again to pretend that a lot of hash rate left and that a long-standing security concern in this space has kind of addressed itself so you know yeah let's kind of watch over the next month or two see what happens like how much hash rate comes back online how much of that is coming from actual you know reputable reliable sources that it is coming back online somewhere besides china and Hopefully the CCP is not pulling another smoke show like they did last year, re-COVID. Yeah, I looked at the numbers and saw it was like down to the same, uh, like the the hash rate was about the same level as it was about a year ago. So, I mean, it took a big hit. And I mean, this is honestly like I'm, you know, I'm kind of bullish on this, like just in the fact of like, you know, yeah, this whole centralized uh, mining in China issue is still like something people talk about and there's just so many people wanting to enter the space like you know the mayor of miami saying like he wants to buy every miner that's leaving china and i know that you got el salvador probably placing bids for those miners and you also got other countries that are trying to make plays and just in other contractors people that are trying to just get a, get a hold of that hardware because like we've discussed is that the hardware is the bottleneck on this uh in this industry and so if a lot of hardware becomes available i'd be looking at the resale markets to just confirm all this but like just from looking at the hash rate it looks like it could be true and i mean like even whenever we were talking about it last week i kind of had this sinking feeling in my stomach like yeah they did finally get the exchanges out of there and like you know if they you know want to push the miners out you know, I'm sure that they can start working and, uh, you know, I'm sure it'll be a fight, but, uh, you know, they'll probably be working for it. And I mean, especially like we're saying, if they're trying to push their own digital yuan and they're trying to make sure that there's not really a free market for that to uh, to interact with. I mean, that's going to be a uh, maybe it's a long game, but it's it's a game to keep pushing them out more and more. And, uh, I, you know, we know how that goes. I mean, it's. There's still going to be ways around it. If a bunch of hash rate is actually fleeing China right now, I will be a very happy man. But I want receipts. Yeah, me too. I'm going to be watching with great interest to see, like, if all of a sudden a bunch of mining facilities start to spin. I mean, we'll report on it if, like, they start spinning up in Texas and Miami and El Salvador and just other areas that are big into mining. Like, you know, if there's more of these upstream data hash huts and, you know, more facilities being built up in other areas i'm i mean i really see it i mean it's like that's where the bullish thing is is to see like what how much uh interest is there in getting this hardware and like is it like where is it going to go and how quickly and you know because um i wouldn't be surprised if there's a little bit of a you know a bidding war for some of it mm -hmm. all right well that leads us well into the next story, which is uh, kind of just a PR update. But I, I think it's fun because it lends some perspective on where the mining market is currently at. So uh, Genesis Digital Assets dropped some PR and a number of different places wrote it up uh, that they have. Uh, well, actually, it was the, their minor provider, uh, Canaan that announced that they were going to buy 10,000 
of the uh, A1246s and A1166s, which are the modern line of pro Avalon miners, which should give them something like another 30 some low 30s megawatt of hash rate. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, I personally wasn't aware that Genesis Digital Assets uh, was mining on their own, but evidently they have uh, low to mid 1% of global hash rate uh, at current uh, capacities. And they claim they're going to add another five and a half exahash in the next 12 months, uh, which is approximately gonna add 2x plus some two to three X more than they currently have, uh, which is uh, pretty substantial. They claim they're going for a gigawatt by 2025. So these, uh, these mining rigs are in short supply, but the biggest and the baddest of the world seem to be able to come up with them. Uh, they claim they currently have 140 megawatts worth of capacity in their various data centers, which I couldn't find a geographic location of. Uh, but adding another 30, that's uh, pushing another quarter worth of megawatts in hash rate over there at uh, Genesis Digital Assets. Economies of scale, man. Like, I'm wondering when we're going to hit the point where if you want to mine as an individual, have fun in the secondhand market because companies like Canon, like micro BT, aren't even going to talk to you anymore. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a big deal. Um, I could definitely see that going through uh, an intermediate dealer network and that sort of thing. Uh, some other things I didn't know that were brought up by the story is that Canon uh, actually as a Nasdaq ticker did not know that. Uh, they claim uh, second quarter is going to see around 250 million in revenue. Uh, I'm not sure if that meant for the quarter or year to date. Um, but either way, that's a lot of revenue per year. They're a big company. What? You didn't watch every single episode we've ever done religiously to learn that before you joined that you're fired, Fud. No. You're, you're fired. There no. we go. That's Q2 revenue. 150 to 250 million. Woof. Yeah. I remember, yeah, initially reporting on them coming into the space and was like very bullish. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's good to see that they're still producing, you know, new hardware and like uh, top of the food chain company as far as like uh you know i remember that because you know at the time it was like bitmain it's trying to ipo and it's like oh god what are we going to do to compete against this damn company luckily it was uh you know canon and some others that finally brought some real competition into the hardware development side are we ready for more china yes so apparently another thing going on um in parallel with the whole mining situation um like Rick mentioned, back in 2017, they forced all exchanges um, to pretty much shut down. And, you know, most of that infrastructure just died off in the country. And the, the meat of that regulation was just effectively like people could still own, buy and sell everything or whatever. But those types of big centralized marketplaces were banned. Well, apparently... Um, the central bank approached the industrial commercial bank, the agricultural bank, um, their construction bank, the postal savings bank, um, and Alipay, and pretty much told them don't do anything that touches crypto um, anymore. Not allowed to do that. And at least um, the agricultural bank of China made an official announcement um, shortly thereafter that all services or use of their platform in relation to cryptocurrency activity is banned so it's looking like if if all of this shit is really happening um they're finally even clamping down on the informal ways that people would still buy and sell these assets um after most of the centralized exchange infrastructure was shut down so yeah um if this is really happening um it looks like they're they're sweeping hard it's a long game, man. It's a long game, and they're playing it. Yep. Well, 
That's sad, man. I mean, it's just like, you know, that's where I'm like really genuinely curious from a, just like a, from my perspective, just curious, like, you know, they get, you know, at, this is where it's like, it seems impossible, you know, like this idea that they're going to get completely like Bitcoin out of the country, Bitcoin mining out of the country. And like, uh, and like eventually they'll have their system that they control and everybody's on that. And nobody is participating in this global free free market. Like, um, gosh, like, uh, it just, I just wonder how they're going to get there. And like, you know, is, it just looks like they're doing it and they're slow rolling it to where they're just trying to slowly get it out completely. But I just don't think it's going to happen. I think we're going to iterate around it. I think that the development will still happen. You can't get it out of people's hands. Like, I mean, people will eventually just have like, uh, you know, some, you know, some private keys that they haven't moved in a long time or some, or a cold card or something or like, a, you know, the open dime, something. I mean, they can't completely get rid of it. It just seems impossible, but they're stupidly trying. All I can hope from news like this is that the U.S. embraces something that China hates. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see which parts of the U.S. does. The red parts. Yeah, because, I mean, geez, let's get into this next story about what's going on in some of the blue parts. So, if you live in Massachusetts, I guess that's how you say that, this state, <laughs> Massachusetts, and you, uh, <laughs> and you, uh, you use, like, a Google phone or a Google services phone, Android, uh, you're currently in some, uh, some serious contact tracing murky water. So, we have this story from the Hacker News website, Y Combinator. It appears Android users in Massachusetts woke up the other day with a new app installed on their smartphones. It's a COVID exposure app that was created by the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts and push installed on everyone's connected, everyone connected to Google architecture. The user, the user on Y Combinator had uh, every relevant UI switch turned off for auto updates from Google Play and the app was still installed on their phone in the middle of the night. And if you read the comments under the app in the Google Play Store, it's it's awful. I mean, but you could see others who had this app installed around their parental guidelines and any other sort of way that they didn't want this installed, it's on there. And it appears to be getting yeah, a lot of people upset there, rightfully so. A lot of one-star awful reviews that show the tyranny of Massachusetts Public Health Department and Google. And uh, as someone that spent just like some moments with Google engineers, they are working on like this crazy technocratic government. They don't like people having freedoms like choosing which apps are installed on your phone. And uh, the story hasn't gained much traction yet, but this is exactly what everyone should be looking out for and pointing out. People in Massachusetts, Mass, you know, Mass... God, that state, man. Massachusetts. We it's called Mass. Yeah, mass. People in ma yeah, people in Mass with Google architecture ought to sell their phones and get dumber devices. It's hard to say what the answer is out, out of this when opt-out isn't even available to your area. I mean, what do you guys think people should do? Like, what do you do to avoid this? Well... I don't have a phone. <laughs> yeah, I was about to, like, dude, this... Yeah, this begs all kinds of questions about any kind of Bitcoin application running on a smartphone that has Google services on it. Don't, like, live, in, don't live in Mass, Massachusetts. The <laughs> instant I saw this, I thought back to the infamous Time Traveler's Prophecy from 2013 on Reddit. And I thought back in the whole time traveling meme he constructed, the part about how Africa and African governments started adopting Bitcoin en masse, and everybody got a free cell phone to help encourage that. And then because everybody was using a homogenous device when it got broken, anybody using it was completely bankrupted. And yeah, um, you know, I, I have been worried about this issue for years, but over the years, every time I brought it up, it's just, well, what else are we going to do? Got to put it in people's hands. And it's like, I'm sorry. Like this, this is something that needs to be seriously rethought from the ground up in terms of how are you going to architect a Bitcoin application and shield it 
from the rest of everything on someone's phone if the argument is going to be what other choice do we have because yeah like you you have a phone with apple on it that hooks up to their shit you have a phone with google services on it that is not your fucking phone and there's already like if you i guarantee if you live in the united states or wherever just search your google like wherever you live department of Pub, uh like just search the name like i searched the name colorado and i saw the department of public health has their own covid exposure app it's not push installed yet but it's just there waiting So my phone, which is an Android phone, definitely prompted me to ask whether I wanted to install that app a couple times. And it was interesting because I've never seen a message that prompted me like, hey, wouldn't wouldn't it be great if you installed this? So this implies to me that somebody higher up in the Massachusetts government had to make the decision and then coordinate with Google to get this done. Because what else could prompt a widespread install like this? I just, I can't imagine uh, mm-hmm. Google wouldn't go out of the way on their own to just try to do it in one state, I don't think. No, it but sounds just, very much like a political connection. But like extrapolate that to just, you can do that for anything. Oh, you know, just just push, push this uh, update to bad man's Bitcoin phone. Give us his coins. Yeah, is this like, um, I'm just curious because I've been, you know, I've been out of the loop for a while, but I've seen this device by Blockstream called Jade. Is this like an attempt to try and create a a way around this? Like, or is there just like, I mean, honestly, like I want to be able, like I've been thinking about this problem too. And I'm like, I want to be able to have like a Bitcoin wallet that I can use somewhere without it being a smartphone. And Um, that's what that looks like the primary purpose of it but i do believe there are plans like over time to kind of build it out to the point where it could potentially work like that yeah because i mean like i would say like you know this is where yeah like we absolutely need to you know as far as like you know putting the message out it's like put the message out that we need like that sort of we need like a cold card wallet like but that's a that you could download software wallets on and uh you know i know that that's sort of like a crazy ask like how do you get hardware like that without the proper funding and everything but i mean like we really need that we need something that people can get that's a device that they can use as a wallet that's not attached to a smartphone because it really does make me uh sometimes i really get worried too just about like uh the potential of like everyone's using these uh, smartphones and like, yeah, Janine, she's got no phone and like, that's a smart freaking move. But it is like when a Bitcoin transaction comes down the road, like, you know, like, uh, I guess that's something you said, you know, somebody would have to set up a long time, you know, set up and be like, I'll do that at a certain moment in my time. But I'm just thinking about daily commerce and people that need to get commerce done and uh you know maybe move lightning transactions and like you know if people that wanted to start go- moving in that direction you know all of it is towards these smartphones that are just huge you know spyware devices and like yeah at some point in time all this architecture is going to turn against us and it's like if we don't start building that out now i don't know you know it, it would it'd be too late if we don't start building that out i mean like when i saw the jade that's what i was like i mean i i kind of want that device just so I can have a wallet that's not on a smartphone. Yeah, the seed signer apps and uh, stuff like Pi Zeros with cameras on them offer potentials for that sort of functionality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the Pine phone, like uh, Fair Play's saying, you know, that's another thing I'm thinking about. And like, uh, I need to look into like the potential with uh, Graphene OS on other devices. But still, it's just so much trust involved where it does seem like if there was. You know, and, um, you know, I don't want to put Rodolfo on blast, but, you know, if there's like a real trusted company that was like building solid hardware, de- solid devices, you know, could could throw something out there, you know, um, geez, I would love it. But I mean, you know, from the other side, though, it's just like what is possible to do in order to, I mean, you, like ultimately it's running on the phone. So if the phone is too fucked. But, like, what can you do to maximally isolate that as much as possible? Because it's, it's like, 
this is the hard part of this problem. For a long time to come, there are going to be people that just have a phone. Yeah. What about them? Um, I mean, you could just give them the advice that I would give to people who have Bitcoin on phones, regardless of how much they trust the phone, which is that, you know, your phone could get lost, your phone could get stolen. You should always have backups of any keys that you have on your phone. And ideally, you the amount that you have on your phone is what you will be using in the immediate term. Like, it's your hot wallet. It's what you're going to spend that day, that week. You know, you're not keeping cold storage on it. Um, and I think, you, you know, that's the best that's the best mitigation in general. Um, if, you know, Google is the uh, adversary here or just, you know, normal blips and you, you lose your device, just keep the minimal amount you need. Don't have everything on it and kind of plan out ahead of time how much you are likely to spend in that week and just keep it to that minimum. Yeah, that's a good advice. And I mean, like, that's probably the best way to go for now. Because I mean, you know, and this is where another one of those just clunky chicken and egg development of Bitcoin and at scale, like, um, you know, more people just have these devices because they've been subsidized and built and thrown out there to the public to where everybody's got them. And I mean, the hope is that if uh, in the long term picture, if Bitcoin development continues in the route it is, then eventually people will value their privacy and, you know, securing um, encryption uh, more than the surveillance side of things. And it should help build out hardware development in that direction. Speaking of hardware. So, uh, in episodes 249, 250, and 252, which, by the way, has the great title of Not Your Keys, Not Your Cock, because of those ransomware <laughs> chastity wearables mentioned by yours truly earlier, uh, we talked about the data breach of Ledger's e-commerce and marketing databases that came to light last year, uh, where over 1 million email addresses and 720,000 shipping orders with information like name, phone number, and address, physical address, uh, were published on raid forums claiming that the data set had been selling for about 5 BTC leading up to that point. Uh, and well, the fallout from this breach continues in addition to scary phishing texts and threatening phone calls. Um, at least one Ledger user whose details were exposed has been targeted with fake Ledger device scam. Uh, as reported in Bleeping Computer, the device came in an authentic-looking package with a poorly written letter explaining that the, the device was sent to replace their existing one as their customer information was leaked online on the RAID forum hacking forum. Uh, for this reason, uh, for security purposes, we have sent you a new device that you must switch to. You, you must switch to a new device to stay safe. There is a manual inside your new box. You can read that to learn how to set up. The, this is all the broken uh, English in the letter. That's why it sounds weird um in the fake letter for this reason we have changed our device structure we now guarantee that this kind of this kind of breach <laughs> never <laughs> happen again uh so even though the letter was filled with grammatical and spelling errors the data for 720,000 people who purchased a ledger device was actually published on raid forums hacking forum in december 2020 this is what we covered this made for a slightly convincing explanation for the sending of the new device uh, based on the photos, a security researcher and offensive USB cable implant expert, Mike Grover, a.k.a. MG, told Bleeping Computer that the threat actors added a flash drive and wired it to the USB connector. This seems to be a simple flash drive strapped onto the ledger with the purpose, uh, uh, for the, with the purpose of um, in having some sort of malware delivery, Grover told Bleeping Computer in a chat. Um, all of the components are on the other side, so I can't confirm if this is just a storage device. Judging by the very novice soldiering work, it's probably just an off-the-shelf mini flash drive uh, removed from its casing. Uh, if you go to www.ledger.com slash phishing campaign status, you can see that they've added this attack to their status page on this topic that they've been updating periodically with anything related to phishing campaigns, uh, especially related to the uh, data breach that was brought to light last year. Um, 
they they write that the fake device comes in authentic looking packaging with the ledger logo the device includes a fake letter and a tampered ledger hardware wallet it is shrink wrapped as if the box has never been opened the fake letter explains that you need to replace your existing hardware wallet to secure your funds this is a scam the ledger nano is fake uh, a flash, flash drive implant has been connected to the printed circuit board. It contains a file of the fake Ledger Live app. There are enclosed instructions in the nano box, which ask the user to connect the device to their computer, open a drive, and run the fake Ledger Live app. To initialize the device, the user is asked to enter his 24 words in the fake Ledger Live app. Uh, this is a scam. A Ledger Nano is not a USB device. It does not contain any application to download and install on your computer. The only way to download the Ledger Live app is by using the official download page. Plus, Ledger and Ledger Live will never ask you to share your 24 feed. So that concludes the latest update in this uh, data breach fiasco. Luckily, English proofreaders are the only thing it, that are more rare in China than Solidity developers. It's pretty great. <laughs> I just have one comment. Wait until things like this start popping up at resellers all over the place. Oh, yeah. Great time yeah, to so just... If Go you're going to buy your hardware, buy it directly from the people who manufacture it, oh. not random places on the internet. Never buy a used ledger or treasure or cold card or open dime or any of that stuff. Like, uh, you know, it's just a bad idea. Yeah, I do just want to point out, um, I mean, it could be the case that the people who orchestrated this scam are just not that great with uh, English, but also there is a whole theory around phishing that a lot of the time some of these things will purposely use broken English because then they will catch the, uh, let's call them less literate, uh, the l less literate portion of victims that they could be targeting and those people are, are less likely to notice that there's something wrong probably less likely to report if something goes wrong their money gets stolen blah 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 so there is kind of a theory behind this madness and it's funny to read poorly written letters but sometimes that is done on purpose That's, yeah that theory is generally uh, at least i've heard it espoused around individual sending email type scams um and when it's company communication, the kind of stuff doesn't fly. Also, I mean, the chances, I don't know, the chances of you dealing with a more literate victim are higher, I would say, if you're dealing with cryptocurrency users. Um, not to say that we're all super smart. There are definitely not some, <laughs> some not super smart people. But yeah, that kind of, I think, would be less effective in this category of people. Yeah, there's definitely an equation to getting uh, an effective scam going. And um, one part is you don't attack the smart people too much. Too much. Yep. All I mean, right. it's, it's also possible. I mean, how many times have you read letters or things in the box? I mean, a bunch of people may not even read the letter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They'll just see, oh, ledger logo, present, free stuff, mine. Let's use it. Oh. Yeah, that's where, you know, it's definitely getting a population that doesn't think about that sort of stuff. stuff. Well, maybe nice. they're going after the same market CNN is. <laughs> <laughs> let's get into this next story. It's our last story. It's a funny one. Let's, uh, let's enjoy it. So, um, courtesy of Coindesk here, it appears CNN, the propagandist news media outlet, is trying to raise more funds through shady sources by selling, quote unquote, moments from their new cha their news channel as NFTs on the Flow blockchain. So let me just stop there for a second and say, lol. Um, later this month... The, the what blockchain? The Flow blockchain. The Flow blockchain. Oh yeah, those are the same guys that brought you crypto kitties. As a woman, I have a negative association with that word. I already don't like this. Oh yeah, it's not in that... It's not in the Flow. Not in the good Flow. So... <laughs> Later this month, the NFT market, quote, Vault by CNN, will launch on the, the blockchain called Flow, selling moments from the cable news 41-year history. Now, this blockchain is the same group that brought you CryptoKitties in 2017, and they are a proof-of-stake blockchain with acid transactions and super flashy good website, much goodness shitcoinery, yes. So... 
That team is now bringing together this funding mechanism to help this propagandist media outlet. CNN says from their press release, quote, The initial launch will include six weekly drops of moments starting in late June 2021. Offerings, offerings will include key historical moments organized around specific themes, including early CNN exclusives, world history, and presidential elections. Users can expect future drops of moments to include an even wider range of digital collectible topics and formats as Vault by CNN grows and adapts to its community of collectors. This is still in their quote. I, it's just so funny I had to keep going. So this is still their quote. The winner of each moment will own the digital copy for collectible purposes. Token holders will be able to showcase and display their moments on a user page in the vault. Some limited edition sets will include a premium video display case that will render a physical representation of the moment on a screen. Close quote. So this is all going down at vault.cnn.com, by the way. So this story is absolutely hilarious, but it's also upsetting to see this uh, dragon not die already. By any measure of journalistic integrity, CNN is a gigantic failure. And I hope this potential economic lifeline will be a huge flop. I just like to think like for a second, like what's going to be the moments they release. And I just hope, I hope one of them has got to be the 2008 financial crash. Rick, you said that this blockchain has proof of stake. It has acid transactions. I just have one question. Does it have enough money to save CNN? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Fud, do you have to read your comment? You can't print boomers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, my comment was I would really like to buy the BLM riot, uh, the moment of the BLM riot at CNN headquarters in Atlanta, if you guys remember that from last summer. Uh, it, <laughs> it almost looked like they were going to get overrun. So uh, I would buy that. Yeah, I was just thinking about like seriously, like all their most historic flop moments and like would they sell those like because – they might actually start making a market, but, you know, some idiots, like, I mean, not, you know, this is where it's crazy, but like, they're going to, you know, they're going to get in this like shady funding source. Like they might get, you know, some people's Bitcoin and like, uh, or whatever the heck this is, their flow. News media makes money off of embarrassing moments. News at 11. <laughs> yeah. Let's just hope it's a flop, but what a good laugh. So I hope that was a funny part. Yep. Just all like right. the desperation, like that is all I see. Just a, a glowing aura of desperation. Yeah. Seriously, who is gonna walk around and be like, "Yeah, I got, I got a moment from CNN. I'm pretty cool." Oh, I'm sure. So you could some DC socialite, but yeah, I hope no one. But I, I could see it being some ridiculous thing, you know, kind of like people bought that gold app where they spent a hundred dollars for this stupid app that just says gold, just to like be like, uh, I'm, you know, I've got the money to spend this on this, you know. It it sounds even more cringy than the Zoom bookshelves. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that about does it for us. So, what are some final thoughts? Anyone? I have one, but it's quite long. I have one. Uh, maybe it's not so long. It's just, uh, you know, like we just passed over um, Father's Day. Uh, happy Father's Day to, uh, to, you know, all the fathers out there in Bitcoin. And we need more Bitcoin fathers out there. Bitcoin mamas, Bitcoin papas. We need them all. So, like, if you're out there and you're, like, thinking, like, geez, like, I don't know, like, the world might get boring or something, or just whatever, like, you know, start thinking about, like, it's time to, you know, have, settle down and have some kids and think about how important that is because, like, it really does, you know, it, it's something that I'm, like, I'm about to be a father, like, I don't know if you got, you know, I haven't really said, I don't know if, I think I said that on a, a few episodes ago, so, like, mm, uh, not sure, I don't know if you have. Oh man, well, you know, it definitely it's out now. Well, it's coming out, but I mean, like, yeah, I'm, it kind of puts the world into a different perspective where it just makes you, you know, it just makes you really work towards the most important things in life for everyone around you. And I think it's important that there's more 
people in Bitcoin that are fathers and mothers and, you know, people that are trying to help change the future and, you know, bring about um, that next generation of uh, Bitcoin holders and people that uh, understand the morals and ethics of why we Bitcoin. You're here. Speaking of uh, fathers, um, it was reported in the Standard UK today, I think, or re very recently, that um, Stella and uh, Assange's two young sons, Gabriel and Max, got to visit him in prison for the first time in eight months on Saturday morning. Despite winning his long-running extradition battle in January against the US, Assange remains in HMP Belmarsh in South London pending the outcome of an appeal. Uh, Miss Morris said that he was happy to see the kids, but he's suffering. You know it's a grim, horrible place. When asked about Assange's mental health, Miss Morris said the situation is utterly intolerable and grotesque and it can't go on. You know he's been in there for two years and going on two and a half years. Today is actually the nine-year anniversary of him going into the Ecuadorian embassy. Uh, she added the situation is just getting more and more oppressive. She hoped that they would remain in the UK if the US prosecutor's appeal was blocked. At least he will be safe here. I just want to be where Julian is safe. She said that she and Assange's lawyers were hopeful that there is less uh, of an appetite to prosecute him in the US following Joe Biden's election victory. And there is an ongoing campaign now uh, in the US to uh, make that a reality. Um, also today, Craig Murray published a blog post comparing his case with Julian's because he is also uh, facing a court case about his reporting regarding a uh, case in the UK where he got in trouble for doing so. And um, he says that Assange's status is that his extradition has been rejected. He ought not to be in jail at all, let alone in such harsh conditions. By contrast, I'm sitting in my study despite being sentenced to eight months in jail. I am at liberty while the Supreme Court decides whether to hear my appeal. My lawyers believe from their contact with the court administrators that it is entirely possible that the Supreme Court will decide on whether to take my appeal within the four-week suspension of my jail sentence granted by Lady Dorian. This is because otherwise I might be imprisoned. Why can the Supreme Court potentially decide whether to hear my appeal so quickly due to the threat of imprisonment when the High Court is taking six times or more as long to decide whether to hear the U.S. appeal when an innocent man is already imprisoned? It makes no sense. Well, yeah, I mean, also, I just, yeah, happy Father's Day to Julian's dad. I mean, like, uh, I saw him on... Um, like a recent, I think, episode of Tucker Carlson a couple times. And I think that's like kind of, I think this whole like move to push domestic terrorism here against conservatives is somehow going to, I hope, play out in Julian's favor because it looks like, you know, they're trying to dismantle the, you know, conservative press. And, you know, it seems to be bringing Julian back out into the limelight. And I just hope that, you know, there's actually a movement within the United States to right that wrong because that is just it's so wrong. <laughs> yep. Well, Fudd, you, you got a thought? Kind of bridge bridge the gap a little more positively, so I can take us out on a trollish note. <sighs> I'm low thought. You go right ahead. All right, we're going right in, guys. If Bitcoin keeps going down, you know, if we if we, we don't moon up, we we don't recover, guys. Then I suggest you do what your parents did, sir. Get a job. <laughs> Later, punks. <laughs> Later, everyone. I refuse. <laughs> Yes, it is so good, yeah.